fart. <laughs> Hello, delicious humans. Thank you so much for coming out to this incredible gathering of community. It's the most special thing to witness. I'm going to do, I'm not going to do very well without getting teary, even just saying this. I was teary through all Wes's stuff, teary through the beginning of the meditation before I dropped into it. It's just, it's so special to be um, amongst such extraordinary people who I think care so much about the world. So when Gary first reached out and invited me to join you here, I felt deeply honoured. I have a thing where it's either, if it's not hell yes, then it's no, and it was a real hell yes. It was such a privilege to be here, so thank you. And uh, in planning tonight, I normally just get up and rabbit straight on about the human body and how remarkable it is and, uh, and what a miracle it is and that we all live so out of touch with how extraordinary we are and I want to bring you back in touch with that. And I'm going to do all of that, I hope. But, well, that's my intention. But the girls in the planning of this, the girls asked me to share, I guess, part of my own journey. And I'll be very honest with you, it's not something that I do easily and not something I do lightly. I get very embarrassed sharing personal stories and I only ever feel like I want to do it when it's of service. So there's no more place to be of service than I think in this room tonight. So... Uh, I want to share with you, I guess, something that awoke in me, and I'm, I apologise, I'm actually going to read it, because every time I practice doing it without reading it, this is my brand new book that I met today, <laughs> it just came off, literally came off the printer, and I have written part of it in here, and I'm going to read it, because uh, every time I tried to do it, uh, I couldn't stop crying, just talking, so bear with me. <laughs> I have no idea where this came from, there was no book I read or conversation that prompted it, but since I was 15 years old, my deepest concern has been that civilization is on the road to destruction unless we create significant change. But as a 15-year-old, I wanted, as I still do now, to trace everything that I wanted to solve to its source, with health, with people's pain, and with the planet. I can clearly recall the creative writing piece our teacher gave us and that I wrote at that age, where we were instructed to write about the topic of conflict. And when I went searching inside myself, there were, I didn't feel that there were conflict in my relationships. I, couldn't, I didn't really understand the word, word. I didn't really feel like I'd experienced it. But I'm a complete goody two-shoes and I needed to do this project that the teacher had instructed us to do, which was to write about conflict. And I don't really understand to this day where it came from other than my own natural intelligence waking me up to something else. But I decided that what I could see was I began to consider everything that I was witnessing in the environment, from burning coal for electricity to the escalating population of the planet. And my solution to the conflict, because we had to find a solution to this conflict, that's what the teacher wanted, between people and planet that I felt was brewing the only thing my 15-year-old brain could come up with was to want less. And it was to shift our focus from ourselves and personal gain and how we appeared to others and instead to see ourselves as part of the whole. I felt that unless we gave up thinking in linear and material ways, there would be no earth left to inhabit. I believe that one of the biggest challenges humanity now faces is this. On the one hand, we, a collective we, want to preserve our natural environment. And on the other, everything we do to grow the economy and preserve our standard of living disrupts the natural environment and our relationships with it. We must raise our consciousness and learn to, learn to think in new ways. To quote Einstein, as we heard earlier, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. We must give up making arbitrary distinctions between human beings and the rest of nature and instead start thinking in terms of the interconnections between all living beings. And to do that, I hope what comes through me tonight here, being of service, I hope that what comes through me helps all of us get back in touch with the magnificence that we are. Because when you know you are enough, you know you have enough. And from this knowing, the children that we raise inherently spend very little time out of touch with their enoughness. And they make their choices accordingly, wanting less, knowing they are enough. And that creates the next generation. And that's how I do my bit to stop the destruction. That's what I do to create more love. That's why I do what I do. It's why I get up in the morning. So from that moment of, oh, you don't need to clap. <laughs> Thanks. So from that moment of 
being a 15-year-old and instructed to write about conflict and not really having anything to write about and catching a glimpse of what I just shared, essentially around the conflict between the humans and the earth that we're inhabiting. I feel that it's fostered something, a, a big picture perspective in me, and it's turned out that it's come through in the way that I help people understand their, their own choices and their own health. So we're going to start now and really focus on the vitality as aspect of it, because I stand here tonight and talk to you about vitality because it really is the true currency of health. It is really what, we, what is so essential for us to be able to see and do beyond the end of our own nose. Because everything is more difficult when we're exhausted. And when we are exhausted, when we don't have that vitality, that bounce to get out of bed, it is so challenging to not just do what's essential. I want you to think about what your life is like when you wake up in the morning. Do you bounce out of bed and think, yes, so blessed to be part of a new day, let's go, or it might be gentler than that, but there's energy, or do you, <laughs> or do you wake up and you can't believe the alarm's going off yet and you think, how can it be morning already and you're press pressing snooze? So think about what life is like because that's how you then go into your day. And I want you to think about with that, with that lethargic, dragging feeling, how you then show up. Whether that showing up is with other humans or whether it is simply being present with yourself, how do you show up with that lack of vitality? We need to have massive conversations around this in, in the world. For too long, weight has been this ridiculous marker of health. And people get up in the morning and weigh themselves and make a decision about how good they are based on that piece of feedback. If we got more in touch with our energy the minute it started to crash, I believe there would be so much less degenerative disease in the world for a start. I believe that we can have a world free from degenerative disease because we understand the mechanisms inside that create it. So let me blow your head off your shoulders about how extraordinary your body is. We are made up of about 50 trillion cells. Now that number goes over our heads so easily. When 50 trillion, what is that? I'm gonna use time as an example to demonstrate that. So one million seconds ago was 12 days ago. One billion, B for billion seconds ago was 32 years ago. But one trillion seconds ago was 32,000 years ago. Now, you have about 50 trillion cells that make you up. It's an extraordinary number. So the best way to imagine it is 50 trillion tiny, tiny, tiny little circles, and they all want to talk to each other. But the only way they can communicate with one another is when there are nutrients present. And I have grave concerns that there are far too many people today who just do not get a basic level of nutrition that is essential for cell-to-cell -cell communication for very basic biochemical processes that need to go on inside of them. It is so difficult to be calm and patient and kind almost when you're not giving your body the substances it requires to create those factors that are necessary to demonstrate those behaviours and those emotions. And I don't, feel, I don't think we give enough uh, light to, to those conversations. Every single second, your body is creating billions and billions of biochemical reactions. So what is that? What does that look like? Biochemistry is, is basically a transformation. It's a reaction. So substance A gets converted into substance B, and then B will become C, and on and on the cascade will go. But for A to turn into B, you might need magnesium and vitamin B6. And if you're deficient in either or both of those, then substance A will accumulate, and you won't have enough substance B. And now maybe when you've got the right amount of substance A in your blood, there's no problem. But if substance A accumulates, it behaves like a poison to your body. And maybe without enough substance B, maybe the consequences of that is that you don't have the substances inside, inside you for a happy, calm, content mood, or restorative sleep, or for you to be able to use body fat as a fuel, whatever it is. In other words, when we become deficient in certain nutrients, there are consequences to that, and one of them is a loss of vitality. It's just that we're not educated to think in that way. You wake up and you, and you feel that loss in vitality first thing in the morning, and you think, I must have slept badly, and so we don't do anything about it. 
And then three years have gone past and you start to think, oh, it must be because I'm getting old. I've had 25-year-olds sit in my office and say to me, oh, well, I'm 25, you know, so I'm supposed to be tired. And my response is, hashtag, you're joking. <laughs> if you're 25 and you're tired, we really need to look at that. There's something going on. So if, if only people use this incredible earth suit as the barometer, as, to, as this vehicle of extraordinary feedback, we can use it in that way. The parts of your body that frustrate or sadden you, including a loss of vitality, if you can begin to see that as a message to wake you up, it's your body giving you feedback that it wants you to do something differently. It's usually saying, will you please eat, drink, move, think, breathe, believe, or perceive in a new way. So instead of this idea that this body is out to betray us, if you can begin to tune into that information, it's all within you. Every single day of my working life, people say to me, I read this diet book and I read this diet book and I don't know whether to eat like this or like this. And they want me to tell them. They know in their own hearts what serves them, and it's no prescribed method. I had a lady say to me today, I've heard that people shouldn't eat until midday. And I said, do you feel hungry before midday? And she said, usually, yes. Well, that's, that's her body saying it's time to eat. Do you see, we look always to the external for advice. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't educated professionals that might need to guide you and give you external advice at times. Of course, that's the case, particularly with health challenges, that can be true. But in your own heart of hearts, there's not a person in this room that doesn't know that they need to eat more vegetables, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we do it. So my approach and what I've begun already this evening, my approach has three prongs to it, the biochemical, the nutritional, and the emotional. So the biochemistry is what we're in now. I'll talk about the nutrients that drive the biochemical reactions that help support the optimum functioning of those biochemical processes that allow us to feel vital and alive. And then the final part of what I'll do tonight is all around helping us explore the question, why do we do what we do when we know what we know? Because it's not a lack of education for anyone in this room if you polish off a packet of chocolate biscuits after dinner, for example. There's no one here who would do that thinking, oh, I'm going to feel so fabulous after I do that. <laughs> it's usually we're not present, but it's biochemical or it's emotional or it's both. And it's why diets will never work, because... When we eat in a way, when, when you know better and you don't eat in the way that you know serves you consistently, I didn't say perfectly, I said consistently. When you don't do that, people use poor quality food, starvation, massive overeating, binge eating, alcohol, whatever it is, it's all a way that we escape from the way things are when they're not how we want them to be. It's a way that we distance ourselves. It's never about the food when we find food a challenge. It's, we're, we're disconnecting, we're distancing ourselves from how things are when they're not how we want them to be. And we'll talk about that just before I finish tonight. So to continue this story around how extraordinary your body is, every single day your heart beats about 100,000 times and it pumps about 7,500 litres of blood through about 96,000 kilometres of blood vessels. And for most of us, it happens without us giving a thought to it, and it happens perfectly. Isn't that extraordinary? Every single month, you completely regenerate your entire outer layer of skin. And I actually didn't know that. I learned it when... Uh, I'm going to give this away, by the way. Um, I learned it when I wrote Beauty from the Inside Out. That our, What happens is your skin is essentially our second biggest organ after... Sorry, it's essentially our biggest organ but it's not really because the lining of the blood vessels, there's more of that, but we don't ever count that as an organ. Anyway, there's lots of skin. And it's an organ, and there's three layers to it. And the cells that end up forming the whole outside layer of our body are born at the bottom of the second layer. It's called the dermis. And the minute they're born, they pick up on the information in the environment that's there. So there's either plenty of nutrients or there are nutrients missing. There are hormones present, and there are, let's at this stage just say there's more love hormones than fear hormones. So that's the information that those brand new baby skin cells pick up on. And they, they think that that's your world. So if there's nutrients missing, they think there's a famine. If there's more fear hormones than love hormones, they think your life's in danger. Because that's the only information that's present. And then they begin their migration process from the bottom of the second layer to the very outside of your body, and that journey takes about 28 days. Doesn't that just blow your mind? 
that they know to do that. The minute they get to the outside of your body, they die. That's it, game over, because oxygen kills them. And it forms a whole outside layer of our body. And they fall off about every 28 days. Usually when I say that, someone in the front row says, I think I should vacuum a bit more frequently. <laughs> they don't fall off all at once. Anyway, I'm going to give that to you as a gift. Would you like it? Stay there, I'll just throw it to you. I hope you love it. Sorry, <laughs> I hope you love it. I'm, just, I'm supposed to stay in the light, which is a lovely... I'm supposed to stay in the light rather than run down. I hope you love it. So every single month... Sorry, every three months, you completely rebuild your whole blood supply. Now, your blood is the only way oxygen and nutrients get around your body. And it's extraordinary to think that with three months of taking great care of yourself with a focus on having great vitality and great energy, with a focus on my goal is to wake up with better energy, my goal is to be more patient, my goal is to embrace kindness, the kindness I know that's in my heart and demonstrate that more outwardly in the world. Whatever it is that you want to embody more, the part that your blood plays of delivering the nutrients throughout your body, it is all brand new every three months. Isn't that extraordinary? You get to impact it that quickly. Every 10 years, adults completely rebuild and remodel every single bone in their body. But for children, that process is happening much faster. They rebuild their skeleton virtually every year, and teens accrue about 50% of their adult bone mass between the ages of 12 and 18. Yet I have grave concerns for our teenagers because when you see them walking down the street, they're nearly always carrying something that's highly processed. And many of, what, many of the things that they're drinking or eating contain substances that stop the calcium from being absorbed into their bones to give it that strength. And I'm very concerned about what we're going to see with a reduced skeletal size for those people at much earlier ages than we potentially experience challenges with bone thinning. So a big part of my work is to make sure that your body, your earth suit, gets what it needs. And I have grave concerns that there are too few people getting what they need for very basic cellular nutrition. And we are so privileged in this room because we live in a world where all of our basic needs are met. And still for too many people today, that is not the case. And we have access to extraordinary quality food. But we need to choose it for ourselves and we need to choose it because we believe in our own hearts that we're worth taking care of. Otherwise, you'll never do it. Because of the incredible advances of Western medicine and emergency medicine we are, and hygiene, we are going to continue to live longer and longer. But what concerns me so greatly is the quality of people's lives and vitality plays a huge role in that because a life without vitality is really tough for you and for the people around you. So I have a big question that I love to ask, are we living too short and dying too long? Because the power to change that is in our hands and in our hands only. Only you can do that. You still want to be able to bend over and do up your own shoelaces in the second half of your life. You imagine what it's like if you let your tummy get too big or your spine becomes so inflexible that you can no longer reach your own feet to do something so basic. And the people I've met who can no longer do that and they rely on someone else to do that for them, the loss of independence breaks their heart. And they wish, they wish they made other choices earlier in their lives. It's just we don't think about it until something like that is gone from our lives. So I want to remind you that it is real food, it is whole foods that nourish us. And the reason I want you to get this whole big picture of how extraordinary your body is before we get into the juice of, of the vitality mechanisms is because when people like me stand here and say to you, uh, I really need you to double the amount of vegetables you eat <laughs> and eat more plant food. And when I say things like that to people, most people think, oh yeah, I know that. Or, oh yeah, I eat a few veggies or... It's like, but we don't do it. And this is why when you provide your body with what it needs for nourishment, all those biochemical reactions can work more efficiently. And I don't believe that people are in touch with how extraordinary they are designed to feel. We've lost touch with that. Watch children. That's all inside of us, that extraordinary energy and vitality. But here is the system that I think plays probably the biggest role in our vitality, and it's our nervous system. It's made up of many different parts. Uh, I'm just going to talk about a couple. It's this extraordinary network of communication zooming about through your body. It's a miracle. The uh, C, you don't need to remember all the big silly words, but some of you will like them. 
the central nervous system is governed by our conscious thinking mind. So we instruct our central nervous system. I can kick my legs, do some squats, speak, stop speaking. All of that's mediated through uh, my central nervous system and my conscious mind instructs it. But the autonomic nervous system, the ANS, is controlled by our subconscious, the part of our nervous system, the part of our wiring that makes our hair grow, our fingernails grow, and that heals a cut. If you cut yourself, you don't have to sit there and talk to it and tell it to heal. Your body has a wisdom, to, that, and it knows to heal that and has the ability to heal that. And every time I say that out loud, it blows my mind that that happens. So it, that's the part of the nervous system that runs a lot of our life. And we're usually not aware of it unless we've done some work in this area. So on the left-hand side, that should, I apologise, that should say SNS, the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is our fight-or-flight response. And it's essentially adrenaline that drives that. So historically, the only time we ever made adrenaline was when our life was literally in danger. When a tiger came out of the jungle at us and we went, ah! and in that moment we were prepared to fight or run away. And when we make that adrenaline, it has a huge number of biochemical consequences inside of us. First thing, the blood pressure goes up. One in three adult Australians have high blood pressure. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, but this is one of them. This is one of the mechanisms. So our blood pressure goes up because we need a greater blood pressure to escape from this supposed danger. Our blood supply that's normally so fantastic to our digestive system, the blood supply is diverted away from digestion to the periphery, to our arms and legs, so that we can escape from the danger. One in five women in this country have irritable bowel syndrome. I like to say it's common, but it's not normal. It shouldn't be that way. Sure, food is playing a role in that, but so is the stress mechanism. And the other thing it massively shifts is the fuel that your body uses. So for some of you, this will be the biggest takeout from the sciencey part of this session. In any given moment, the human body is making a decision which fuel to use, and it can only choose either glucose, or I could say sugar, or fat. That's it, or a combination of both. That's it. And when you're living in, in sympathetic nervous system dominance, when you're living in that red zone, in the fight or flight response, the adrenaline is saying to every ounce of your being that your life is in danger. And so therefore, your body has to provide you with a fuel to get you out of that danger. And it has to choose between glucose and fat, and it wants the fast burning one. So which one do you think is the fast burn one? Glucose every time. So if you imagine a flame inside you, a flame of energy, a flame of vitality, you could throw petrol onto that flame to give it fuel. That's what sugar does. That's what the glucose does. Burnt in two seconds. Whereas when we utilise our body fat as a fuel, it's more like putting a piece of wood on the fire. It's a slow burn. It generates a lovely, calm, even energy that can go forever. The challenge as well is that when we constantly use our glucose instead of our body fat as fuel because we're living in this stressed out state, sure, clothes get tighter, but that's not what tonight's about. When you live on sugar, it's burnt so quickly. So it spikes and then it crashes in your blood. It spikes and it crashes. But get a load of this, a 70 kilogram person will store about 2,500 calories of glucose, that we store it as glycogen, in our liver and our muscles. So 2,500 calories of glucose. But that same 70 kilogram person will store about 130,000 calories of fat, which is why if there really was a famine, we can live for quite a long time, because we can use that body fat as fuel to keep us going for energy. However, because the glucose is the get out of danger fuel, the minute that fuel tank gets below about half full, your desire for it has to be switched back on. Because your body's concern is that if it gets below half full, you might run out and then you won't be able to save your own life when the danger really does hit. So I meet so many people who make amazing choices for breakfast and lunch and then at three o'clock in the afternoon, they feel like someone else has taken over their body with the sugar cravings, they get so strong. And I'm, of course, I'm not saying willpower or desire to take better care of yourself. I'm, I'm, of course, those things can make a difference. I simply want you to understand that so much of our energy and our vitality on a physical level comes from using predominantly fat as a fuel. And I meet person after person, day after day, who has lost the ability to effectively use their body fat as fuel. And they don't have to have tight clothes for that to be happening. 
It comes through in a number of different symptoms that they present with. So when we train our body to predominantly use body fat as a fuel, you have the, you, your, your level of calm goes through the roof. So what we want to do to come out of the sympathetic nervous system dominance, what activates it? What leads us to make adrenaline in modern times? It's not tigers coming out of jungles at us. Block your ears because it's caffeine and it's our perception of pressure and urgency. And what word did I put in front of pressure and urgency? Perception. And it's because it is, and I think we forget that. People have made what they have to do every day, they've made it full of pressure and urgency. They have lost touch with the privilege life that they have. They've lost touch with the fact that they have clean running water and a warm, be a warm bed to sleep in tonight. We forget that when we're so focused on ticking a to-do list off, for example. And when you live in that cycle of feeling like whatever you do is never enough, when you feel like that's, that you're not a good enough daughter, mother, father, colleague, son, whatever it is, when you live in that space, you live forever in sympathetic nervous system dominance. And so another big part of what I want to raise tonight, and there's not the time to really get to the heart of it, but I want to raise it tonight is when there is a behaviour that you display that you know is harmful to you or to the people around you, even if that's just rushing and zooming through things because you then display impatience and you regret what you say afterwards when you feel impatient, or someone in your family leaves a wet towel on the floor and you blow your stack when yeah, they need to pick it up and it's respectful to pick it up, but it doesn't warrant, the punishment doesn't warrant the crime. So when you want to explore something like that, what so many of us do that holds us in this fight or flight response is the minute we explode or behave in a way we don't like, we judge ourselves. You put a comma in your sentence. If you eat too many chocolate biscuits, you say, I ate too many chocolate biscuits, comma, therefore I'm hopeless and pathetic and I've got no willpower. And the minute you put the comma and pass the judgment, you lose the ability to go in and take a look. And that's where the juice is. That's your road in. Whatever your thing is, is your road in. But the judgment blocks it and you become blind in that instant. So I believe the key is to bring curiosity when you display a behaviour that you don't like, whatever has set it up, far too much coffee across the day, six million deadlines, 45 emails, uh, make it 450, probably not 45. <laughs> whatever it is that has really heightened your response and led you to make a huge amount of adrenaline in a day, if you then, even if it's within, if it's not dis behaviour that's displayed on the outside, it's behaviour that you can experience within. Your heart's racing, you might have reflux, the monkey mind is more intense than ever, you feel like you've got so many tabs open in your brain, that feeling. <laughs> Nothing flattens your battery faster than what I've just described. But if you can get to the heart of it and see where you created the belief that you're not enough the way you are, you can end that war with yourself because for every day you paint the war, you want to take a week and paint the beauty. It's not that we don't go there, we touch it, we're human, but it's how long you stay there that impacts what you do in the world. And the longer you paint the war within yourself, the longer you do that, I believe the less we can see beyond the end of our own nose, because all we do is what we have to do, not see the world of possibility and the massive challenges that humanity is facing and take a step in the direction of making a difference towards that, because we can all do that. <laughs> Oh, thank you. So I feel like we've lost touch with taking care of the earth suit and fostering that, fostering the ability to meditate, fostering the ability to plug in. The natural intelligence that is inside every single human, the natural intelligence that's in an acorn that grows that acorn into an oak tree. You think you're separate from that. We're not separate from it. That is in you. It's just that I feel like we walk around with like we're lamps and we walk into these places where there's all this electricity and we forget to plug in. And in my limited time on this planet so far, the only way I know to plug in is meditation. And that's why I honour Gary and Tim and this whole Conscious Club team for bringing it to light and having a conversation around meditation and its benefits, but allowing us all to experience it in a collective setting. And it's so much more powerful in a collective setting. So thank you. Thank you.
So we want to, yes, thank you to those amazing humans. <laughs> So to come out of that sympathetic nervous system dominance, you've got to be honest with yourself about how caffeine affects you. I'm not the anti-coffee girl, <laughs> but you've got to get honest with how it affects you as an individual. And you'll notice, you have, just pay attention to what it does. You know in your own heart when you're having too much. I'm not saying don't have any, although there are people in this room who, who that would literally change their life. For others, it's about cutting back. For others, it may not affect them at all. But tune into that and explore your perception of pressure and urgency. I'm not denying there aren't things that aren't urgent, but you want to save it, it for what's really, you want to save it for when you really need it, not make what you've got to do every day urgent, otherwise you live here all the time. And we want to activate the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest, digest and repair mechanism of the body. The only way science currently knows to activate the parasympathetic nervous system is to extend the length of the exhalation. That's it. And it is why a breath-focused practice has the most extraordinary effect on our chemistry. Because if you, look, if you walk into a room of adults, mostly the only part of them that moves when they're sitting around a table, the only part of them that moves is this top part of their chest. And it's adrenaline driving that. So that person is sitting there in that meeting, their body's belief is that their life is in danger. And then there's all of the biochemical consequences that come with that. But when we breathe diaphragmatically, so when we inhale and our belly sticks out and we exhale and our belly comes back in, when you breathe like that, you've moved your diaphragm. And when you do that, you've communicated to every cell in your body that you're safe. And nothing else can do that. Because remember I said you can't get into the ANS, you can't get into the autonomic nervous system with your conscious mind. You can't have 50 coffees and 25 new deadlines and sit there and go, just chill out, dude, it's, it's, it's okay. It doesn't work. Your mind can't override it. The only way you can impact the autonomic nervous system is with how you breathe. So the more we have an awareness and that conscious breathing, the more we do that, I believe the better our health and vitality is. So three simple steps to begin to take. Explore caffeine, explore your perception of pressure and urgency, and schedule diaphragmatic breathing. Or become a conscious breather is, is a simple way to say it. And that alone, just those steps alone, can be game-changing to how you feel and how you function, how you relate to yourself and the people in your world every single day. So you can see that the nervous system impacts the fuel that you burn, it impacts your energy and vitality, it impacts your sleep because when you're living on adrenaline, your body doesn't want you to sleep deeply and restoratively. It wants to keep you ever so slightly awake so that you can defend yourself if there really is a threat to your life. Uh, and so many people, that, that not sleeping well is the beginning of the poor food choices, not moving their body, what, whatever it is. The, cons the ripple effect of lousy sleep can be enormous. The things that people spend a fortune trying to deal with from the outside in our skin, for example, it doesn't need to be taken care of when your body thinks your life's in danger. So things like skin and hair and nails and even the reproductive system, they don't get any of the juice. They don't get the, the nutrients being focused on them when your body constantly thinks that you've got to save your own life. So those non-essential processes, essential to save your life, those non-essential processes can be compromised when we constantly live in that fight or flight response. When it comes to our sex hormones, uh, and it's something that I focused on when I did a TEDx talk, progesterone for both men and women is a powerful anti-anxiety agent, a powerful anti, uh, sorry, antidepressant, and it's a diuretic. Progesterone, a sex hormone. In a female's body, it's massively linked to fertility because she makes the bulk of it once she ovulates from the crater that remains in the surface of her ovary. But we also make, both men and women make progesterone from their adrenal glands, which sit on top of our kidneys. But that's also where you make your stress hormones from. And when you're churning out adrenaline, your body believes that your life's in danger. And when you're churning out cortisol, your body thinks there's no food left in the world. And the last thing it wants for someone is to bring a baby into a world where the perception of the body is that you're not safe and there's no food. And so the body will think it's doing you a great big favor and it will shut down your adrenal production of progesterone. You park the fertility aspect of what I've just said, because that's a big topic that I talk about in my women's weekends. But think about what else I just said. You lose the hormone that allows you to not feel anxious, to not go to a depressed mood, and you retain fluid. 
And particularly for a woman, when she feels her anxieties and she feels depressed and she's retaining fluid, she feels disgusting. And that impacts the food she chooses, whether she goes for a walk or sits on the couch, the job she applies for, the friends that she makes, her inner dialogue, and how she speaks to everyone she loves in the world. So the ripple effect of that massive production of stress hormones impacting on those sex hormones, I believe is diabolical. And a big part of my work is to give women the strategies to begin to address that. Because we've been on the humans a bit, science suggests that humans have been on the planet for about 150,000 years. And if I pretend that that's a 30 centimetre ruler, the last 2015 years, which is the length of our calendar, is not even one centimetre on that 30 centimetre ruler. The last 100 years is not even a millimetre in that enormity of time. So the rate of change we're asking our body to go through is now like never before in the entirety of human history. And our nervous system is getting the most confused messages, or essentially it's getting inaccurate messages, forever thinking that our life is in danger. So it's up to us to raise our consciousness, to embrace a new way of living inside as well as externally, so that our own personal health and vitality doesn't suffer as we begin to adjust to this, to this new kind of world. I talk about it in my book, Rushing Woman Syndrome, and there's a lady in the second row who I'd really like to have that you've got glasses on. Yes, <laughs> there you are. I won't throw it, you can have it, thank you. I hope you really love it. <laughs> and as we talked about, it impacts our, our food choices and our sugar cravings when we deplete that system. So just to finish, when I first went to work with people, I was taught, I originally trained as a dietitian, and uh, when I went, we were taught that you just need to tell people how to eat and then they'll go away and do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you get out and you work with people and of course that's not the case. And, but being someone that wanted to really help people get the outcomes that they were seeking, I had to find a way to help people understand their own behaviour and why they did what they did. So this is the best way I have right now to explain that. When we want to make a change in any area of our life, whether it's our body, our fitness, our level of contribution, our kindness, whatever it is, we usually will make a decision about that and set a goal. It can be we can write it up and do it formally or we just know we're moving in that direction. We usually get a plan, we might Google it, we might consult a professional, you might do a dream board or you just know that, like I said, that's the direction you're heading in. Then we execute it, after a while we assess how we're going and then eventually, especially in this day and age, people are never happy with how quickly the change is happening. And so they make a correction. And most people make a correction to the plan. And I'm not denying that a plan of action that serves you is, it needs to be individualised and appropriate for you. It does, absolutely. But there are a lot of plans of action out there that would serve our health, for example, when it comes to taking care of uh, our nourishment. And a lot of people think that they need to change the plan. But where the juice is, is, and what interests me, is what allows you to consistently execute a plan that serves you. What are, when you know the benefits of meditation and you go twice and then you don't go to class for the rest of the year or sit and do your own practice, when you know the benefits of that, what are you saying to yourself? When you know you need to stop eating packets and packets of whatever it is, but you don't, what are you saying to yourself? I don't really care about you. That's essentially what we're saying. So the juice is in the consistency of the execution of taking care of ourselves, not perfection, just the consistency of it. We will do more to avoid pain than we will ever do to have pleasure, though. We're wired that way because we've got to escape from danger. That's in our nervous system. The thing is that for every single human, our greatest fear is that we're not enough, and if we're not enough, then we won't be loved. And because of that, the perception that love is essential for our survival is hardwired into our autonomic nervous system. Now, as little humans, that's true. Someone's got to care enough for us to feed us, give us clothing and shelter. But for adults, we know a life with love in it is beautiful and delicious and soul-nourishing, but because we can, on a physical level, get our own food and clothing and shelter, we can live without it. We can actually physically survive without it. It's just that most people still live their lives as if they need it. Because when we're little, we're egocentric. Sadly, I think lots of people don't shift from that. But anyway, 
that we're egocentric. And all that really means is that you believe the humans in your environment are the way they are because of you. So if they're happy, you think it's because of you. If they're cranky, you think it's because of you. And that's how kids are. But what we do is when the adult, when the big, when we're little and the big humans in our life behave in a way that's unpredictable to us or hurtful to us or frightening to us, whatever it is, you can't see that that behavior is coming from their challenges. When you're little, you hero worship them because that you believe their love, their presence is essential for your survival. So the only way your nervous system can make sense of their dysfunction and their lousy behavior is for you to create a belief in your own deficiency. And it's usually something along the lines of, I'm not something enough. I'm not good enough, I'm not tall enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not thin enough, I'm not smart enough, or just I'm not good enough, I'm not enough. I'm not enough the way I am. And so begins, in my eyes now, the journey home. Because this happens to every single human. There is not one of us that avoids it. It's our human journey. And that belief creates safety for you in that moment. But our job as adults is to decipher it because that belief can create such massive dysfunctional behavior outwardly in the world and so much ill health. And it's a story you made up a really long time ago to survive because of their challenges, not yours. But you live your life today as if they're true. And your beliefs determine your whole experience of the world. If you think there aren't enough hours in the day, that will be your experience. If you think people can't be trusted, that is all you will see. Someone can't be trusted, there's another one, there's another one, and you will miss the zillions of people in the middle of all of that who can be. You know what it's like when you suddenly want to buy a new car or pick on a red Corolla? Don't you just see them everywhere? There's one, there's one. There's not suddenly more red Corollas on the road. They've always been there. What you've done is you've primed what's called the reticular activating system in your brain to find them. And exactly the same thing happens. Oh, women go, oh, it's a sign. I better get one. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> it's a sign, yep. <laughs> but exactly the same thing happens with our beliefs. If you believe that you're not good enough, with, every, with so many discussions and interactions you have with people across the day, that will be your experience, that you're not good enough. Because you go looking for that evidence everywhere. So you see the world how you see the world, not how it really is. You see the world how you are, not how it is. That's why that you can have a, two people grow up and the two children grow up in the same family and when you talk to them, it's as if they've been raised by different people. It's all this stuff. And this brain that sits on top of our shoulders is an extraordinary gift to us, but it can also be our biggest challenge to make peace with because it's a very powerful meaning maker. So with every one of those interactions, you create a meaning about what that just meant. And I, the, the most succinct way I can share what I'm talking about with this is to tell you a brief story of a client I worked with many years ago now who was the walking example of this. I'm going to describe her physically so you can picture her because I feel like that's powerful. She was 60 years old. She was of Irish heritage and she was as short as she was round. And she came to me because she wanted to lose weight. But she said to me, I have great knowledge and I eat so much cake after dinner and I know that's what I need to change. So if your only solution to my weight loss is to tell me to stop eating cake, if it was that easy, I would have done it already. Have you got any other options? I said, yes, let's do this. So I ask my millions of questions, everything from do you have headaches, do you have sinus congestion, do you use your bowels every day, what was menopause like, all those questions. And then I get to the point where I say, are your parents still alive? And because up until, I'm giving away all my secrets now, but if you, up until that point in time in that session, I've been very focused on their physical body and their physical health. And when I ask the question about the parents being alive, I think that most people think I'm looking for degenerative disease in mum or dad, heart disease, family histories of things. And I partly am, but not really. What I'm trying to notice and feel is their response to my question around their parents being alive or not. And it's usually very obvious. And with this particular lady, it was incredibly obvious. So she uh, said to me her mother passed away giving birth to her and her father hadn't spoken to her since she was 14. She's with me sitting there when she's 60. And I said, what happened? She said, Dad took me home from hospital. We lived on a great big farm in country island uh, and my father worked the farm. I had four big brothers. The nearest one to me in age was 13. 
She said, it was very quiet and peaceful. I was very good at school. I helped with the house. It was a lovely life. I loved it. But she said, then when I was 14, my father wrote a letter of introduction and he, he put me on a boat and sent me to New Zealand to be raised by a distant aunt and I never heard from him again. But here's the kicker. He loved my brothers enough to keep them. He didn't love me enough to keep me. I believe that humans have beautiful hearts and really good intentions. The behaviour can go awry at times. And so I said to her, what if the opposite is true? What if he loved you so much that he was prepared to send his one and only precious daughter away, his one and only daughter that his own beloved wife who had passed away giving birth to? What if he was prepared to send you away and never see you again to the other side of the world to have a female raise you, to help you have a better education? You were 14, you were probably just about to start to menstruate and he probably wanted a woman to support you through that. What if he sent you away because he loved you so much? And she said, I've never thought about it like that. And I said, well, you said he's still alive. So I said, is there any way you could contact him? And she said, I could probably get a phone number. And I, a bit bolshy, said, why don't you phone him and ask him why he sent you away? And to my absolute astonishment, she did. And he gave her a version of what I just said to you. So she lived her life in the cloud of false belief from the age of 14 to the age of 60 that her father didn't love her. And so she didn't sit on the couch at night eating cake because with a consciousness around, dad doesn't love me, dad doesn't love me, I better eat cake. But when we live in a way, whatever it is for you, when you live in a way that you know doesn't serve you, it is how you're distancing yourself from the way things are when they're not how you want them to be. And blocking it with food or alcohol or anything does not serve the world. Whatever that thing is that you're not comfortable with, imagine facing it. Yes, it takes courage, but it also takes vitality. So I never once talked to that lady about cake, never mentioned it. She just stopped eating it. She would have still had it when she went out for a cup of tea with her friends, I'm sure, which is perfect. But she lost weight without us even having a conversation around it. So I give you that story because I feel that it powerfully represents what we've all, in a way, done to ourselves. So when you're cruising through your day and everything's fine, it might not be amazing, but it's not terrible. And then something shifts and you're irritated or you're sad or you're withdrawn or you just, my mum calls it gritty, you got that going on, don't judge it and initially try not to respond to it. Bring curiosity to it and work out what's led you there. Are you physically hungry? It's time for afternoon tea. Maybe you need to look at having a different kind of lunch. Or did you just have a conversation with someone and it hurt your feelings, but you don't ever let that show or you don't ever acknowledge that? So I believe that we have a responsibility as adults to be emotionally responsible. And the more we raise our consciousness, the more that, that, the more that flows and the more that comes to life. I believe there is so much vitality in authenticity, in not dimming your light, trying to be someone that you're not to try to please other people. There is so much vitality and so much beauty in authenticity. And I want to encourage you to recognise everything you contribute to, to this world, just not because of anything you do or anything you say, just because of who you are. If you knew who you truly are, you would be in awe of yourself. You would blow your own head off your own shoulders with how extraordinary you are. So in saying that, I, I want to finish um, by thanking you for your interest in uh, enhancing your vitality <laughs> because I believe um, that, as I said, without, without vitality, without energy, everything is more difficult. I am on a tour at the moment. I'm speaking in Sydney again on the 28th of September. If that appeals to you learning more, um, then please go to my website, Dr Libby. But all of that aside... I just can't encourage you enough to get back in touch with how extraordinary you are. And I don't mean that with any kind of ego. I mean with the gift that life is. Get back in touch with that. And it kind of sounds cheesy, but when you live your life from that place, just that knowing, just that gratitude, it's not even a conscious thought that when you turn the tap on, the water's clean and you can drink it. Just bring awareness to every motion, every activity, every process you go to and bring gratitude to that because you shift away from that fight or flight response into that beautiful, calm place 
and it changes everything, especially your vitality. So please remember that life is precious and that you are precious and to treat yourselves accordingly. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.